Welcome back, Mitochondriacs, for another episode of Cancer is a Mitochondrial Metabolic Disease. I am excited to be back with you today to further discuss metabolic therapy for cancer. And we have now successfully made it through the vitamin D and melatonin series. And I want to now take a good amount of time to systematically go over metabolic therapy as a whole and every single known either natural or pharmaceutical agent that can help us in our endeavor to block the critical metabolic pathways that drive cancer growth and progression. So let's get into it. So I want to start out with looking at the metabolism of normal cells. And what this is a graphic of is a non-tumor, non-cancer, cell that is using normal energy metabolism or oxidative phosphorylation, okay? So we have glycolysis, which is the breakdown of glucose and sugar into pyruvate. Pyruvate is going to get shuttled into the mitochondria and be used in the TCA cycle to create certain chemicals such as NADH and FADH2 that's then going to be shuttled and be used in the electron transport chain and oxfos or oxidative phosphorylation or using the electron transport chain to create energy produces in general about 80% of energy in a classical sense. These are aerobic conditions. And in this electron transport chain and oxidative phosphorylation, we're going to have some degree of normal reactive oxygen and reactive nitrogen species created. And that is redox biology, that is redox chemistry, that is normal. And we have the redox products like ROS, RNS can feed back on the system to either throttle up the reactive oxygen species scavenging system through nuclear genes and the antioxidant response elements. This is normal physiology. In addition to that, we have the ability with normal cells to be metabolically flexible where we can take either fatty acids, fat or ketone bodies and break them down and put them into the same TCA cycle to create energy through oxfos. So what differentiates us, our normal cells and tumor cells, is that we can use beta oxidation, fatty acids, and ketone bodies as fuel just fine and run electron transport. But what I'm highlighting here is, is that the vast majority of energy is produced by glycolysis, fatty acid oxidation, or ketone oxidation, some degree of amino acid oxidation, talking like 5% or less. And then as some people know, when we are in anaerobic activity, such as sprinting or resistance training, we will use anaerobic glycolysis. Remember, the Warburg effect is aerobic glycolysis, anaerobic glycolysis to create lactate and give us that high-speed ATP we need to do those high-intensity exercises, which ultimately are limited in their capacity and time frame. So I'm going to take us back to some of the basics here, okay? So we have a normal cell. We have something in the environment that is going to act as a carcinogen, okay? That's going to damage both nuclear and probably more importantly, mitochondrial DNA. As mitochondrial DNA becomes more heteroplastic, you hit some biologic threshold where the mitochondria are not able to maintain bioenergetic output and they're putting off excess reactive oxygen species, which is damaging structures, including nuclear DNA, leading to mutations. That is called mitochondrial heteroplasmy. And doesn't this look very similar to Dr. Seafried's paper here, where you have a normal mitochondria that's producing the majority of the energy, and then over time, oxfos goes down and aerobic glycolysis goes up because now we don't have the capacity to make energy in the way that we normally would through the normal biochemical pathways and electron transport oxfos. So as we can see here, as malignancy or as cancer progresses, it progressively uses less and less oxfos to where it's not able to maintain itself using the normal processes. And it starts to rely heavily or nearly exclusively on glycolysis and the Warburg effect, the fermentation of glucose and glutamine. So this is a picture essentially of a transitional cell, okay? So this is an oxygen-consuming phenotype 
partial mitochondrial defects. This is if we were kind of in the middle of this graph, okay? If we were in the middle of either these heteroplasmic graphs or either the middle of this graph, we have significant damage going on. We have ineffective ATP being produced. We have partially utilized oxidative respiration. We are now more utilizing glucose and glutamine and more lactate is being built up. And we are then in the process of transformation. And this ties in completely with some of the other concepts that we have seen. We've seen that a normal cell, when you have adequate amounts of mitophagy and or autophagy, that protects the cell from excess heteroplasmy. But when you lose autophagy, when you have abnormal or insufficient or ineffective mitophagy, then carcinogenesis can happen. And what ultimately happens is, is that we end up in this vicious cycle where either hypoxia, low oxygen environments, or very importantly, pseudohypoxia. Pseudohypoxia is where conditions in the cell and in the environment are leading to hypoxic-like conditions without true hypoxia, okay? The oxygen levels are normal, but HIF-1 or the HIFs, the hypoxia-inducible factors are being activated abnormally or stabilized. These hypoxia-inducible factors are being translocated to the nucleus and they are altering metabolism and they are absolutely part of this entire process of inflammation, tumor acidosis, migration, invasion, stem cells, the epithelial mesenchymal transition, and angiogenesis, which puts us into a tumor progression, but also a metastatic type of a situation as well. Not good. And this is kind of an overview. We have hypoxia or pseudohypoxia leading to HIF stabilization, which then leads to the Warburg effect. And HIF, as I said, is at the crossroads of all of this for both invasion into other tissues, cancer stem cell, creation, metabolic reprogramming to the Warburg effect, pathologic survival mechanisms, gene alterations, cancer-associated inflammation. HIF-1 is a major node in the story that has to be dealt with aggressively. And not only does HIF-1 do all these things we're talking about here, but it also directly inhibits mitochondrial function by inhibiting electron transport and as we talked to about in the past as well, excess HIF stabilization leads to excess mitophagy, excess reliance on glycolysis and the Warburg effect. It essentially shuts down the ability for the cell even to use mitochondrial physiology, both at the electron transport level and through excess mitophagy and clearance of excess mitochondrial mass, which leads us back to a slide we covered quite a while ago where we saw that wild type normal mitochondria will use normal metabolism and the mutant mitochondria, the heteroplastic mitochondria, essentially are reliant on glucose and glutamine, the Warburg metabolism, because that's the only thing left. There's no other way to survive. And this is what creates the vicious cycle that we're worried about. And this is what metabolic therapy ultimately is going to address, which leaves us with the true Achilles heel, but also the true driver of cancer metabolism, of cancer growth, of cancer invasion, of cancer survival against the immune system of cancer metastatic potential. And that is the Warburg metabolism. So now we have defective mitochondria that are not able to use oxfos. Oxfos is basically essentially shut down either through excess mitophagy or through inability for mitochondria to actually function due to hypoxia inducible factor being overexpressed and overutilized. And remember, this picture says hypoxia, but it's also pseudohypoxia. This is critical to understand. So that's going to then upregulate all the things that are associated with Warburg metabolism, excess glucose uptake, excess glycolysis related enzymes, excess lactate dehydrogenase and lactate formation, excess glutaminolysis, which leads to the dreaded Warburg metabolism that is part of the problem. And this is just another graphic representation of that exact same thing. Glucose uptake, glutamine uptake, glutamine utilization, lactate dehydrogenase are all induced by either HIF-1 alpha or HIF-2 alpha. And you can see why everywhere the lightning bolts are present, that is where HIF-1 is inducing at multiple steps the Warburg effect. And that ends up leading to a normal cell where you have some amount of glucose, gets converted to pyruvate, gets shuttled into the TCA cycle, gets utilized as ATP production. We have this cancer metabolism, which brings in 10 to 30 times more glucose. We use 10 to 30 times more glutamine and we have huge amounts of lactic acid, which then sets us up for the tumor microenvironment. And the tumor microenvironment with lactate as the driver, that's why it's an acidic tumor microenvironment, will suppress the immune system, will lead to metastatic disease, will lead to drug and therapy resistance, 
will ultimately lead to fuel for cancer cells by reverse Warburg metabolism. And again, it is the acidification of the tumor microenvironment, TME. And this is just another picture showing that glucose, pyruvate, pyruvate to lactate, pathologically, lactate shut all outside the cell. That leads to proliferation, chemotherapy resistance, immune suppression, building of blood vessels, migration, and invasion of other tissues, which leads to metastatic disease, changes the pH, inflammation, inflammatory markers, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. This is the problem. And this is what metabolic therapy is going to address. So ultimately, the basic mechanism of metabolic therapy is going to cut off the pathologic metabolism of cancer cells. And how do we do that? We use calorie restricted, again, case by case basis. If you're a cachectic cancer patient, that's gonna not probably be a good idea for you. Again, these are always discussions between you and your treating physician, but it's gonna be a, ideally a calorie restricted ketogenic diet. I added this EpiPaleo because I'm a big fan of Dr. Jack Cruz, and I do believe that having high omega-3s is critical. Intermittent or prolonged fasting on a case-by-case -case basis, glutamine inhibiting compounds, glucose lowering compounds, glycolysis inhibiting compounds, lactate dehydrogenase inhibitors, HIF-1 alpha and HIF-2 alpha, destabilization strategies. What is not going to be shown on that prior slide is other strategies that we can also employ that is not part of the classic press pulse metabolic therapy. And that is looking at trying to shut down excessive use of the PPP here or the pentose phosphate pathway, which is a major way that cancer cells get a hold of the ability to make glutathione and protect themselves against excess oxidative stress, which can be employed against cancer cells, both from conventional chemotherapy and from alternative therapies such as IV vitamin C and hyperbaric oxygen therapy. Another strategy we can use is trying to shut down the biosynthesis of macromolecules such as fatty acids and the inhibition of nucleic acid synthesis so that cancer cells cannot rapidly proliferate. So. I just wanted to quickly go over, and again, this is Dr. Seafried's version, or at least initial version of the press pulse protocol, his brainchild of metabolic therapy for the management of cancer. And you can see here for the press therapies, which means there's gonna be a constant. This is gonna be going on continuously throughout the therapy that are employed. And that is a ketogenic diet restricted, a therapeutic ketogenic diet with additional ketone supplementation. That is a constant. Then he talks about the management of stress, which is going to help reduce glucose in another way by reducing cortisol and catecholamines. And I would add in several other things that can be employed in this as well, but I'll digress. This is his basic framework. And so stress management is also a constant. Then for the pulses, he would recommend pulsing inhibitors of glucose uptake and utilization, glutamine uptake and utilization, and then hyperbaric oxygen. And these are done in pulses where you have a disease, that disease is managed ultimately until you have either an NAD or a resolution of that disease process. That is the goal. And we are going to be utilizing these basic metabolic strategies that utilize the Achilles heel of cancer, glucose depletion, glutamine depletion, supplemental ketones, shutting down PPP, reduce biosynthesis of necessary components for rapid proliferation and growth. And we'll also talk about for the cancer cells that are in this type of situation, in the middle, before you get to a point of no return, in this middle oxygen consuming phenotype, the idea of metabolic reprogramming back to normal physiology. If you remember back from both the vitamin D series and the melatonin series, there was indications that melatonin and vitamin D can metabolically reprogram, basically fix the aberrant metabolism before it gets to this point of no return. And if it got to that point of no return, inducing apoptosis. But if you could take this point of a danger zone, when you have a significant amount of heteroplasmy and a biologic threshold is met, if you could reverse that, if you could reverse course, and try to revert cells back to a normal cell, that would also be part of the strategy. And that is unfortunately not part of the strategy that Dr. Seafree lays out,
which is why I do believe this is a little bit more of a comprehensive and holistic view of what can be done using metabolic therapies for cancer. I hope that this provides a, a decent high level overview of what is possible with metabolic therapy for cancer. What is the goal and what are the therapeutic targets for metabolic therapy for cancer? And as we get into the next coming weeks and months, we're going to be going over every single known pharmaceutical, nutraceutical supplement or therapeutic modality that can attack these biochemical aberrant pathways to help you get to, God willing, an NED or resolution situation, or at minimum, manage the disease to where you are no longer at risk of morbidity and mortality with these diseases. No one is saying guaranteed, but these therapies make biologic sense. And if we can focus on safe therapies that make good biologic sense, that exploit what we know cancer cells utilize for their metabolism, we can have a true paradigm shift in the treatment of cancer and have much better outcomes from this terrible disease. If you have something you want to say and share, comment, please. If you like this video, please like it. If you think that this video and the information within this video or other videos that we've posted so far are valuable to you or someone else that you know or love or care about who has these kind of disease processes, please share it with them. And until next time.